hate it, want the next one. It's just a cycle. It's just a cycle that keeps on going. So, you know, whatever they're going to be doing with it, it's not going to change it. I agree. I agree. So when it comes to the largest technical leap for the hardware generation that they mentioned during a podcast, what would you look for in the next machine? And I know you have the PlayStation 5. I never considered it uh, that heavily, right? Maybe one day, but no, no rush to do that. So what would you want to see in the next major console leap? I don't know at this point. I really don't. I think something that I would like to see come back because I think it was one of their greatest accessories and I had so much fun with it that I wish they developed on it more was their connect. I I loved it. I really did. There are so many games that utilize that and like people are still using the connect for other purposes, whether it be for VR or anything that's not even game related. I I would love to see that kind of come back again. And then it'll probably be used in some VR, you know, if Xbox ever comes into the VR space, um, iteration for it. Mm. But I would love another like Just Dance okay. and just utilizing the connect. I don't know. I just really love that. That I maybe I'm like in a small percentage that did, but I had a lot of fun. That with it. talks about the connect. And, I think so. Yeah, probably. But like to have a true gaming experience that really required no controller. Right. I, I was a lot of fun. Um, as far as what it could, um, I cannot remember the content creator. Um, but there is this, uh, there is this woman. Uh, she created this cerebral headgear thing that takes your neural synapses and you can pretty much play games without a controller, just using your mind. I feel like Microsoft would definitely buy that patent from her and mm. include it into there simply for just accessibility. Right. Um, I feel like that is definitely a market that is getting more attention, getting more love for it. Uh, that would be a very great, huge investment for for Microsoft or okay. PlayStation, whoever gets to it. But I got I got to send you because it's so, it's so mind blowing that this content creator has created this and you she's posted clips of her using this and just how she just thinks about something to get something to happen in game. Like she's just visioning it and then and it's happening it on screen. reads it and then it happens and i'm like this is really really cool um i'm just thinking outside of the box now as far as hardware about what they're going to be developing what hard drives what cpu what graphics or anything like that at this point games look amazing they do i think they look better on but, pc right but that's me <laughs> right and that's the thing so, yeah. The game, I agree. Games look amazing, but did it, do they look any different than they did a few years ago? Have we made that major jump? And I think that's that's debatable for any camp, right? When you look at when you can look at Batman, the Arkham series, and you could still put that up against any game today. Did we really make that big of a leap? Yes and no. Uh, OK, <laughs> you yes know, no. OK, all right, because. If you are a triple A studio, yes, you have the team to max out and fully utilize, whether it be Xboxes or PlayStation's hardware to the extreme. You're a smaller team. You can get kind of close to that level, but not quite. So in terms of graphics, it really depends. I think it really depends on the studio and team that is working on it to really get that that visual difference. Um, right. I think. I think the other conversation, too, is frames that are consistent and at staying at the number that we're expecting it to stay at. We shouldn't be wondering if a game is going to stay at 60 at this point. And even in this console generation, that's still a conversation that people are not really happy about, that certain consoles can't hold a frame that should be standard at at this stage with the technology that we have. Right. So so we're not even talking about even the hard drive space, because at this point we should have at least three or four gigs. Well, not gigs, uh, TB, right. Uh, terabytes by default in the system, or at least at a the very least at the very least. And, and that's crazy when you think about where we used to be. Remember when Xbox 360 had the 20 gig hard drive? I think it was at one point yeah. we were like, 
Oh my gosh, this is so much space, right? But not at the very least, four terabytes at the very least. That should be, you know, standard. 20 gigs is not even enough for a like, Call of Duty update. It's not. It is not. Okay. <laughs> it is absolutely not, right? So, so I think, you know, so with the space, you know, four terabytes at, at the very least, um, holding a frames, you know, 60 at the bare minimum for any console that's going to come out. And, you know, visually, you know, if they could, you know, hold our attention, right? Uh, we look at games like, and, and I think that it, it's, I don't even know why we're still talking about this game, but this game keeps coming up. The Batman Arkham series, it's one of the most beautiful series, like even now, even to date, you can put it against like Suicide Squad. Suicide Squad does not look better, in my opinion, than the Batman series. I could get hate on that. But that's how I feel. OK, you might. You might. That's how I feel. It doesn't. It doesn't. Right. So so you have the hard drive space and of course, RAM, you know, whatever the standard is for the consoles. I don't usually pay attention to that. And then you go into the conversation with the teraflops. How many flops is this or that? Um, I don't think most consumers care about that. They just care about their games working. I think we talk about those things because we give, you know, the stats and the specs of whatever the system is and what's coming out. But when I'm playing a game, I'm not thinking about teraflops. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking about the guy that I just need to go get in this domination match because they're at the section right now. And I need to go get B, go get B. That's what I'm thinking. I'm not thinking, Hey, this, these teraflops is, you know, it's amazing. I'm not thinking about that. So I think that, you know, getting back to, and what's the point of all that? Apple has a great way of promoting. It's products where they don't have to do all that jargon to get your attention. And the whole marketing has been surrounded by that. If you ask a Apple diehard fan what is in their phone, they won't be able to really tell you what is in their phone by way of specs, but they could tell you what the phone does and they could show you all the things that they do. And I think even taking lessons from that, I think it will be critical for the next uh, consoles and the next generation. I am going to say here, and I don't know if this is an age thing, probably is an age thing, um, but I don't know if I, I'm going to care about if it's going to boast like, oh, it natively does 4K or 8K. I'm going to tell you right now, I can't tell the difference between the 4K and the 8K. Oh, I can't. Um, I don't I don't know if that's just because I'm old or or what, but yeah, I think it's definitely going to have to be something that can your hardware offer stabilized, consistent frame rates? And I honestly can't say if I care if it's going to like support AK at all. Yeah, I, I don't I, we don't care. And it's not like we don't care in a bad way. It's just like those things are not our concerns anymore. But what is concerning is the technology that we've seen gradually being implemented in the controllers, you know, the Hall effects and stuff like that. Anti stick drift. We care about that. So. Their next controller for the next system coming out should have that by default, or at least have the implementation for you to actually make the upgrade. I know BFG, the pro BFG did that. They're coming out with the Xbox controller uh, first quarter of 2024, which we're technically still in, right? That's going to be the Xbox controller and it's going to give the, the swappable Hall effect replacements or upgrades for that particular controller. Now, any other company making a controller that is a big company like a Nintendo or Xbox or or PlayStation. If you're not going to do that for your controllers, especially in the next generation, that's a loss. That's an immediate loss if you don't do that. Right. So mm -hmm. so we talked about the the hard drive space. We talked about, you know, graphical uh, fidelity. Uh, controllers are definitely important. Inputs are definitely important. Um, and. And what you're going to charge for that as well. Is it still going to be in the same range that we're paying for controllers right now? 60 to $80 since games are going up to 70. And it seems like that's going to be a standard across the board moving forward, even though some companies are reviewing that, if that's going to be a case for them, right? Because we can get some good games on Steam and they're not $70, right? So I think there's a lot of things up in the air when it comes to the largest technical leap. And I hope that technical leap is the hardware that's going to support the creators, not just the developers, because there's a difference, 
right? So, so even what you were saying before, um, when you were saying the word creator, creator in the context of that particular Xbox, you know, podcast isn't me, isn't you. No. And may not even be you, the viewer, right? It's the developer developing the games. Now, all creators in their own right uh, understand, understandable, but I think we just have to be mindful of what's happening in that as well. And, and even game making um, seems like it's a little bit easier on these current consoles too for the developer, right? Mm-hmm. And I say that because when PlayStation 3 first came out, it was a struggle for developers to develop on that. That didn't get better until the, the later half of that cycle uh, for PlayStation 3 because it was a nightmare for the developers at the time. So things have gotten better. You know, I'm not I'm not like a Debbie Downer here. Things have gotten better. Right. Yeah. But to have more games developed for these these platforms. Right. Right. It definitely got has gotten better. Any final thoughts on that? I know we, we spent some time um, here. What I wish he kind of expanded m- more on was um, I feel it was kind of brief on uh, touching on the subject, but he asked about the 2023 year that it was not. Man, I wish I could remember how he said it. It wasn't a productive year for the industry. Hence, that's what led to, you know, these layoffs on all of these studios, even in Microsoft. Kind of wish he kind of went in on, on a little bit of that, because that's the part I guess I, I don't understand on, on, on that business side of it. Because from our standpoint, they had all of these great sales. They had all of these great releases. Everybody's loving it. It was doing like to us. It looked like they were doing great. But then for him to kind of say that it wasn't, you know, a growing year for the industry. And I'm like, hmm, I want to I wanted to hear more about that. And I think my, my last thing um, is it, nothing that was really said during this show, just like only 22 minutes long. I would love just for a business standpoint, not necessarily a competitive, directly competitive way, but I think it would be great. Because he was talking about the industry, talking about, you know, decisions that they have to make as a business and, you know, wanting to grow that um, not necessarily. Yes, for themselves, but just overall is I would love to have Xbox and PlayStation just have their own little one off podcast show to talk about how both of these companies not like, yeah, they're both trying to grow, trying to outdo the, each, each other, but also to I guess, enhance the gaming experience for their consumers. You know what? They're- that is a great idea. And, you know, you're brilliant, by the way, because this is a great segue for console wars where we had, you know, a, the same company, OK, fighting each other. Right. You had SOJ and Sega of America fighting each other when they could have done some amazing things. We could probably still have a console for Sega right now if they just understood that one band, one sound, everybody wins. Right. So to your point, it'd be great to see, you know, companies do that. And, you know, they have the conversation and I'm sure, you know, the the friendships allow certain conversations to happen. Right. But even in the documentary, we saw that one or two decision destroyed you know, what we know of, you know, Sega today by way of not having a console anymore. So it's like, is the conversation going to mean that things are going to be for the good or is it going to be, you know, for the bad for the consumers? It depends, right? Because internally, if there's infighting, right, in divisions of, I'm not saying that this is the case right now, whether it's Nintendo or PlayStation or Xbox mentioning all of them is there in fight. If there's infighting, then that doesn't benefit, you know, team morale. And that bleeds into the projects that actually gets released to the public, to the consumers, because those devs, wherever they may be, they leave, you know, and they start their own company. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We see that time 